like and subscribe for endless entertainment. Our story starts off with a little one crash landing on Mars and awakening to find the princess of the Verse Empire showing him some love in order to save his life. Five years later, we find a Salem excited to finally visit Earth for the first time, while asking many questions about the unending water source and breathable air that can be found on the planet, when Count Cruteo suddenly interrupts their conversation then asks the princess to go to her own chamber since she will be leaving soon, so a Salem bids Slane farewell as he remains in the room surrounded by darkness. A few hours later, the princess meets with Slane to reveal that she is about to depart on her journey to start peace negotiations between their people, before thanking him for all the knowledge he gave her throughout the years. Fearing for her life, Slane decides to give a Salem the one thing he truly owns in this world as a good luck charm, but she refuses since it's the only thing that's left for him to remember his father until Slane points out that as their savior they would both like her to wear the necklace to honor them. The princess thanks him for his gift as Criteo comes into the room to announce that it's time to go. She enters the elevator alongside her maid while questioning why the people of Verse hate Earthlings so much even though they were all originally from the same planet. But the maid explains that when the first emperor was blessed with the power of all Noah, the Martians became their own distinct race separate from all the lesser people left on Earth, and as Salem confesses that even though in the past the two people didn't get along, she now desires to build peaceful relations so the prejudice between them can come to an end. On the level above we see the Count slapping his hardwood across Slane's face, while blaming him for putting all the stupid thoughts about harmony in the princess's head which has now put her at the mercy of their enemies then warns that the next time his punishment will be far more severe. Criteo arrives in the command room to watch as Salem depart into orbit when he suddenly gets a call from Count Sazbaum who he tells that the princess would not change her mind from this folly, however the Count reveals that she should be safe as hurting the royal heir in any way will invite disaster to Earth, though he does admit that since a war would cause chaos they could climb the ladder to gain more power and take the entire planet for themselves. But Criteo immediately dismisses this line of thinking since their first duty as orbital knights are to keep the royal family safe. It's explained that when astronauts first went to the moon they discovered the Hypergate which paved the way for humans to terraform Mars, but when the explorers found ancient technology far beyond what humans currently had, the leader among them claimed the title of emperor and declared war on their homeland. But as both sides battled to gain control over the Hypergate, it exploded while taking out a chunk of the moon which later rained down on the planet to cause untold destruction. On the motherland, we find Inaho making bacon pancakes for his older sister who overslept again, and reminds her that she is their drill officer for today before heading off to school. He catches the bus where our MC meets up with his friends, then they start talking about all the wonderful things they're going to accomplish in the years to come, because surely nothing bad is going to happen to them in the near future. The students arrive at school with Inaho's sister following close behind, she tells the teacher to stop drinking since if the children were to notice they would lose respect for him but he admits that was lost a long time ago, however Yuki confesses that the teacher was a fine soldier in her eyes before she goes to give the students the best PE session in the history of mankind. A few hours later we find the teacher drinking his trauma away as his doctor arrives to vibe with him, he tells his psychologist that the army has added military training to the high school syllabus while passing it off as normal but secretly they're making young soldiers to send into the grinder if war ever arises. He remembers 15 years ago when he saw the power of Old Noah and admits that no matter how much training or preparations they make the earthlings are like cockroaches under the feet of the Martians. Everyone gathers on the streets to witness the Princess of Verse visiting their planet for the first time, but some shady-looking mofos communicate from the shadows to open up a truck that fires off a barrage of missiles. All the people stand unaware of their impending doom, but Inaho who watches the projectile thrust through the sky to give the princess her first gender reveal party, all of the cars that are traveling with the royal heir are exploded by boomers, however a Salem's vehicle somehow manages to escape the carnage until two more people the leaders arrives to flip over the car to make escape next to impossible. 
The princess crawls from the vroom vroom and looks up into the sky to experience a close-up fireworks show to the shock of the entire crowd as the assassins withdraw from the crime scene. On the moon base, Count Sasbaum calls for all the orbital knights to unite to avenge their fallen princess, while Kriteo blames himself for her becoming a hashtag and descends on the planet to bring the people of Earth to their knees. Two little ones watch a beautiful meteor shower fall from the sky and wish that everyone can be happy, however in New Orleans all the people are pissed off because of all the traffic on the bridge, but they notice that an orbital knight's fortress has come to unleash the sun on their city while giving everything nearby a roasting session that will be talked about for the remainder of human history. The army begins sending out their soldiers to surround the fortresses before they can deploy any ground troops to secure the location, however the Orbital Knight's first move was to take out all means of communication to cripple the planet, then he begins to obliterate all the military presence in the area. The American mechs search for their enemy but when one of them finds the Orbital Knight, he is gifted an all-expense paid ticket to the Gates of Heaven that is also redeemable for all his teammates who got effortlessly squad wiped. We head over to Beijing to find the Orbital Knight giving the Chinese mechs the BDSM treatment, while in Maputo we see that the Africans are standing on business but their pew-pews have no effect on the overpowered Gundam, though in the land of the rising sun the Japanese try their best to fight back. However the soldiers just get mercilessly penetrated and feels nothing but unmatched terror as they face off against the godlike robot. The news report that all the major areas had come under attack so everyone starts evacuating to the shelters scattered throughout the city, and Naho calls his sister to ask when she's going to pick him up but Yuki tells him that she will be fighting in the war so he should go on one of the transport vehicles and head to safety. Our MC travels through the city where he notices two strangers standing under the bridge and tells them about the evacuation, but the woman introduces Inaho to the floor before asking why the people are leaving so he explains everything that's been happening around the world. She confesses that the princess is still alive since the unnatural gravity of Earth made her too sick to travel and it was a body double that became past tense, then Inaho admits that help will arrive here soon since he already texted the evacuation team their location. They go inside the transport truck conveniently filled with all the relevant characters where they nearly crash into a squad of titans, and Naho's sister tells them to leave and find somewhere safe immediately since this place will soon become a combat zone. Inside of Criteo's fortress, a baron with an interesting shaped haircut enters the command center in order to personally ask for the honor of securing the location where the princess met her end, and the count tells him to gather up all the leaders in the region so they can investigate why the earthlings did something so foolish. Slain gets ready to depart as the pilot that will guide the orbital knight and flies him through the sky until they meet some unfortunate bastards heading their way, the air force launches people the leaders towards their enemy but of course that move was not very effective, then Baron Dong had orders Slain to open fire on his people but the pilot can't bring himself to do it. The orbital knight takes control to show the low-leveled noobs that they're nothing compared to people who paid for the DLC character while taunting Slain about how effortlessly the earthlings were slaughtered. The assassins stand on the bridge waiting to return home alongside his daughter, but when Baron Wiener headlands in front of his fellow Martians he congratulates them on completing the mission before wiping them off the face of the earth to hide the truth of what really happened. The Orbital Knight notices that one witness remained alive and tries his best to reunite the young lady with her father, as the Titan squad arrives on the scene and begins wasting ammo on their opponent while Inaho's sister goes over to rescue the civilian, she takes the woman into her arms before making a hasty retreat to safety trusting that the rest of her teammates can hold off the Orbital Knight. Baron Phallic Head jumps over to the enemy mechs to start playing a lethal game of patty cakes with all his victims, then returns his attention to the assassin's daughter. The teacher tries his best to keep the Gundam busy for as long as possible, but all his efforts are meaningless before the might of those blessed with the All Spark, so Yuki begins withdrawing from the battlefield and calls over the evacuation team to drop off the civilian, but the Martian catches up with them to show us that his hands are rated E for everyone. And Naho's sister conveniently lands on the vehicle so the students take the chance to drive away from certain demise, RMC notices that they are going too slow to escape Baron Shaft Head, and tells them to hit the brakes so they can shave off some weight before flooring it with their newfound speed to outrun the Iron Giant. 
One of the students goes on top to help Yuki escape from the Titan, however during the chase he gets launched into the air and our MC comes in clutch to lend a hand, but Baron Erection Head causes a tremor that sends Inaho's friend directly into the Shadow Realm, right before our party arrives at a tunnel where the Orbital Knight chooses to end the chase. Everyone begins exiting the van and notices that they're one person short, as Yuki's mech opens to report that the Martian is still outside the underpass waiting for them so they should try their best to keep its attention so the rest of the citizens can evacuate the city safely. But Inaho becomes the leader of the survivors and decides that instead of being decoys they are going to put the Orbital Knight on a t-shirt to avenge their fallen friend, and our party makes the school their base to recover weapons that can lead them to victory. At Count Sasbaum's fortress, we find him talking to Baron Peckerhead to inquire about the status of their accomplices, and he confesses that one of them managed to escape, but since Slane is monitoring the locations where the tunnels lead she will not be able to hide for long. Sasbaum tells him that they don't have the time to wait, so he resolves to wipe out the entire city using a meteor shower even though Criteo's fortress may be caught in the blast and orders Baron Schlonghead to maintain watch until the orbital strike arrives. At the school in Naho tries to run an experiment by flying a drone through the tunnel until it comes in contact with the Gundam waiting patiently outside, and after doing the test he discovers that the mech has the ability to absorb anything it comes in contact with including radio signals. They theorize that to move so precisely while chasing them there must be something feeding it information from the sky, which also answers why the Orbital Knight never enters the tunnel. Our party begins making a plan to slide on their op when the mysterious woman offers to help them, along with the assassin's daughter who seeks to get it back in blood. On the military base they begin preparations to withdraw from the area because all its defenders are now hashtags, however the teacher reveals that his students are still in the city acting as bait to keep everyone safe and begs the officers to help him save them. The soldiers hastily put together a rescue crew with the sole objective of taking the little ones outside the combat zone, but they suddenly see flares in the distance that signals them to launch an attack immediately. Our Autobots roll out with the two waifus in the armored vehicle and Baron Willy Head instantly gets notified of their movements, the students spot the Orbital Knight coming their way and see the cameras that send him information hovering close by, they start firing smoke grenades into the sky to block his vision which renders the Gundam momentarily useless, until Clutch Godslain arrives on the scene to direct the Martian towards the car carrying the assassin's daughter. They begin pew-pewing at the pilot and he retaliates by blowing the mech off its feet, prior to the other student using a rocket to take out one of Slane's wings, and Naho prepares to enter the battle in his own Eva as the Gundam slowly closes in on our waifus, but the women realize that they still have to buy more time in order for their plan to succeed. The Orbital Knight manages to disable the Vroom Vroom permanently, and in a bid to stall their pursuer the mysterious woman starts walking towards Baron Willy Head while commanding him to stop his war crimes at once, then the stranger reveals the very obvious fact that she was the princess in disguise all along. Shocked by this revelation the Orbital Knight tries to retreat however the teacher arrives on the scene and begins launching people the leaders at the Martian though it has no effect at all. But while Baron Prickhead is distracted the students pew pews the bridge until it takes enough damage to collapse under his huge frame to plunge him into the ocean. They notice that the water is being absorbed everywhere except a small entrance under its armpit and Inaho uses the information to close in on his opponent to penetrate deep inside him from behind. RMC explains that they knew that there must be gaps in his barrier because he can walk on the ground plus receive camera feeds from his drones as he puts his pole into the Martian's hole and gives Baron Banana Head some catastrophic back shots to bring this fight to an end. Everyone is shocked by what the students managed to accomplish yet our party quickly realizes that they must withdraw from this location before any backup arrives to help the Martian. After they leave we sadly find out that Baron Granulated Sea Star Head is still alive, Slain says that they should go save the princess but the Orbital Knight confesses that he needs to make her past tense or she will brand all who were part of his plan as traitors. 
the pilot draws the Martians pure and channels the power of America to put a brand new hole in Baron Mushroomhead's chest to bring the mighty Orbital Knight to his knees, before ending the poor bastard's subscription to life by rearranging his guts. The meteor bombardment arrives to remove the entire city off the map for years to come but our main characters conveniently made it out just in time to avoid being Isekai'd, it's revealed that all our survivors were already moved to the ship and Inaho's sister congratulates him on keeping all of them safe, as the princess who's still in disguise asks to speak with him privately while Yuki cheers him on for potentially getting some cheeks. A Salem gathers everyone who knows her secret and explains that they must find some way to tell the Verse Emperor that she is still alive in order to end this war, however Inaho points out that the Martians have destroyed all their means of communication so he has to convince the higher-ups to help them. The maid protests this since they must keep the princess's presence a secret because the enemies have spies hidden among the earthlings who would do her harm. They return to the storage area where the students mourn their fallen friend and swear to get revenge on all Martians for what they did to the city, while Inaho discusses with Rayet about what to do next, he tells her that they should not let anyone find out the truth considering that in times of war people will listen to their emotions over reason. But the assassin's daughter says that she will be watching the princess closely because no one from the Verse Empire can be trusted. In the night we find the ship docking at a cargo port that will be made into their new base while they wait for the army to bring our survivors to safety, everyone begins working together to empty their load all over the camp, but a soldier sees a hostile Eva using their comrade's loot box as a shield before tossing it away. He starts pew-pewing the enemy so the Gundam quickly runs behind cover which allows the Titan squad to close in on the Martian's location. The Orbital Knight rejoices from this challenge and activates the Alvnoa Drive to power a super-hot plasma blade to do battle with his foe. They use their advantage and range against the melee unit but he cuts through any projectiles that come close before going over to show the Earthlings how they divide by two on Mars. Our survivors have regrouped on the ship to flee back to the sea where they can destroy it from afar, however the Orbital Knight comes on board to play catch with his sword and take out a control tower. The student watches as their doom slowly walks towards them and the princess resolves to reveal herself to him despite the risks if it means that everyone else will be safe, but Inaho tells her to remain inside while he takes on this new threat. RMC gets ready to kick some ass while giving the two students their own roles to perform, they activate their titans to face off against the orbital knight and Inaho starts pew-pewing with explosive ammo but it's not very effective, so he swaps to armor-piercing rounds which forces the Martian to use the extreme heat of his weapon to change the trajectory of the hole makers in order to keep himself safe. The Orbital Knight notices a student sneaking behind him and dashes towards Inaho who dodges a devastating strike then goes down on the Martian to restrict his movements, RMC is brought to the ground by overwhelming strength when a crane suddenly knocks the Gundam away while doing heavy damage to it. The students begin doing a team ultimate to push back their enemy as much as they can when a blast suddenly comes from the ocean to interrupt the battle. It's revealed that the army has finally arrived in the combat zone as they channel the American spirit to rain down hell until the Orbital Knight is forced to make a hasty retreat, and Naho's classmate scolds him for acting recklessly because without the military's convenient timing they would have lost, but all he notices is the princess thanking him for saving their lives. At Criteo's castle Slain reports that Baron Male Genitalia had passed away in the orbital strike and the Count is determined to investigate who would launch such a reckless attack after he avenges a Salem. The pilot is about to reveal his discovery until he remembers that anyone could be involved in the conspiracy against the princess, then Count Criteo drives his third leg deep into Slain's stomach for daring to speak out of place, before leaving the young man breathless on the floor. The pilot goes down to the docking area where he sees the Orbital Knight coming back from a shameful defeat, after hearing the details of the battle slain realizes that it must have been the same person who destroyed Baron Glizzyhead, but the Martian says that he will get his revenge once the repairs are completed. 
In the command room, Count Criteo meets with Sasbaum and tells him that an unknown orbital knight dropped a kill streak near his fortress that resulted in the loss of a powerful Gundam. Nevertheless, when the conversation ends, Sasbaum commands his underlings to launch an investigation since Baron Chickenhead was warned about the meteor shower. The ground troops survey the area where they discovered that the Orbital Knight's mech took heavy damage and was abandoned before the city was destroyed, so Count Sasbaum decides to look into Slane since he is the only witness. On planet Mars the Verse Emperor finds out what has been happening on Earth. He questions why they would invite their own destruction, but the messenger theorizes that because only the royal family can activate the power of al Noah, the enemy hoped to cripple them by striking down a member of his line. However, the king is not convinced and orders a ceasefire to this war that has claimed millions of innocent lives until he has presented evidence of the Earthling's treachery. We go over to the ship where our MVPs meet with the officers who thank them for their help while the princess makes her way to the command center to reveal the truth to everyone, as an alarm suddenly goes off because the samurai Gundam has returned to get it back in blood. He draws his sword and begins destroying all the purists around him as the Titan squad prepares to deploy. The teacher tries to help but is overcome by PTSD while the other mechs channels the American spirit, but the Orbital Knights proves that his parry game is on point before giving the poor bastard a free lesson in penetration, then stands in front of the command center so they can no longer use their weapons freely. The Orbital Knight begins smuffing on the low-level noobs, and only backs up when finally a worthy opponent arrives to have a legendary battle, and Naho starts pew-pewing to lure the vengeful Martian into close combat, but when the fight seems lost, it's revealed that our MC is using combustible armor to deflect the blades with high-powered blasts while taking the chance to hold his enemy in place. And Naho tells the commander to tilt the ship which makes both of the mechs start to slide towards the ocean, but in the last minute our MC ejects from his EVA, leaving the Orbital Knight to fall into the water with his plasma blades and abruptly perish in a massive steam explosion that completely destroys the awesome mech, as Inaho gently glides down into the merciless embrace of the ocean. At Criteo's fortress, the Count watches the transmission of the ceasefire, then decides to speak with the Emperor directly using the audience chamber, where he's told to uncover the details of the princess's assassination. Slain watches as everyone leaves the room which gives him a chance to sneak in unnoticed so he can activate the tower that transports his mind to Mars. The pilot runs through the castle until he finds the throne room and sees that the king of the Great Verse Empire is a bedridden old man. Slain kneels before the monarch to tell him of all the secrets that he has discovered about the conspiracy within the Orbital Knights. The Emperor listens to all the pilot's revelations then thanks him for the information, but after he leaves it's revealed that Count Sasbaum has already poisoned the King's mind against all Earthlings, and accuses Slane of exploiting the Princess's death by spreading lies that benefit his people while turning Martians against each other. Confronted by what he believes to be the true nature of the people born to Earth, the Emperor begins the war anew with the goal of complete genocide across the entire planet. Criteo commands his guards to put Slane on a t-shirt, but Sasbaum asks to take him alive since his father was the head researcher of the Aldnoa Drive, so he may know something useful. The pilot takes a Martian hostage to ask about our party and the direction they were last seen headed, before making his way to the docking area where he constructs an escape plan to successfully depart from Criteo's fortress. On the ship the commander assembled all our survivors to a meeting and explains that as of this moment all of them have been drafted to fight for their very existence on this planet. The recruiters begin interviewing all the candidates who had military training in high school to assign them a task in the war, but the princess escapes enlistment by pretending to have an illness. Our party discusses their new jobs in life when the teacher comes over to tell them not to worry because everyone on both sides of this war are virgins to the occupation since all the experienced soldiers passed away 15 years ago in the moon explosion. And Naho points out the teacher survived the battle, but he explains they went up against the enemy Gundam with a fleet of tanks so they were all slaughtered, and after he wrote his report about the Martian's advanced technology the officers in command thought he went mad then dismissed it. 
Hours later, we find the princess enjoying the scenery with our MC by her side, and Naho asks about the Adnoa Drive, so she reveals that it's a power source that only members of the royal family can activate, which gives her people technology that shouldn't normally be possible. But while the Martians are more advanced their planet has little resources available and this is why some members of the Orbital Knights wants to forcibly make Earth a part of the Empire. In the command center it's decided to make the place where the teacher's entire unit was wiped out their base, reasoning that it has a population of zero and it's unlikely that any Martian would target that area. The victim of war reminisces about his past, when the doctor questions if it's the right time to be drinking, the teacher makes the best throw in the world to honor all the friends that were lost on the island, as the commander joins them on deck. The captain reveals that her big brother was also there with the teacher in the first invasion, and she can't find it in his heart to forgive him for smoking her sibling instead of finding a way for both of them to escape, the teacher starts tweaking from this sudden admission as a heavy object suddenly crashes into the ship to signal an enemy attack. It's revealed that robotic hands have begun relentlessly fisting the ship until it can no longer handle the pressure and stops responding to controls. All of our party suits up in their EVAs to fight against this new threat, while the Orbital Knight watches her victim from afar and shows pity for what's about to happen to the unnamed characters. She unleashes the Doom Fists on the poor bastards though the Titan Squad tries to pew pew them down, but they're completely bulletproof, so no matter what they do it always ends in them getting an unwanted hand job. The teacher goes towards the robot to try and help once again, but his crippling trauma prevents him from even moving a muscle. Meanwhile, the commander orders everyone to abandon ship, which leads to a hasty evacuation of all on board. The Orbital Knight decides to stop playing around then launches lethal high-fives to end our survivor's subscription to life, however Inaho has begun to use explosive rounds in order to throw the master hands off course until he eventually runs out of ammo, and the Martian takes this chance to give them a fisting from the heavens. But when all seems lost the projectile is suddenly deflected as Clutch God Slain arrives on the battlefield. All our survivors are surprised to see a Martian fighting on their side, though Inaho accepts it since they need all the help they can get. The Orbital Knight decides to lend the newcomer a hand before launching her massive fisters at the pilot in an attempt to forcefully open his back door, so Slane does a barrel roll to avoid this horrific fate, but the arms continue to hunt him down until RMC steps in to start pewing them out of the sky and actually manages to damage the master hand. Inaho goes down to act as a shield for the survivors, then gives all of them a mild concussion as he deflects the Doom Fists heading their way, which crashes into a cliffside that conveniently reveals a big hole in the island. And the commander takes the chance to use the remainder of the vessel's power to vigorously thrust towards the only opening that leads to safety while Inaho along with the Titan Squad charges to face off against their enemy. Our allies intentionally bust all over the only opening to collapse the entrance of this mysterious cavern before smashing into a military base that none of the officers even knew was there. The army begins escorting all the survivors that are still alive deeper into the chamber where the captain salutes the amphibious assault ship for its outstanding service then bids it farewell for the last time. But while she's walking away the soldiers come over to report something very interesting. Inside the cargo room, a Salem blames herself for the war that has brought humanity to the brink of extinction because if she didn't come down to Earth seeking peace then the assassins couldn't have used her passing as an excuse to invade, and Rayet confirms that this is all her fault, as the officers hurry to pass them. The commander stands before a destroyed Gundam where the teacher joins them to explain that this Eva was the one who ended his squad's subscription to life which makes everyone realize the military only covered up his report to keep their discovery on the battlefield a secret, and our survivors notice a deus ex machina resting at the bottom of the facility. They enter the Deucalion to see if there is any way to bring the systems back online, but the soldiers quickly find the vessel to be useless to them since it's powered by an Aldnoa drive and no one has any idea how to activate it. However, a Salem enters the room and gives Four Eyes a closer look at the floor for trying to stop her, before revealing that she is the first princess of the Verse Empire. On the outside we find Slain protecting our survivors in the sky while Inaho is looking out for him from below. 
they start making a plan to close in on the orbital night since that would make all her weapons useless then the pilot descends while opening his back port so our MC can mount him to accomplish the forbidden fusion. In Naho rides Slane towards the climax of this battle, however the Martian sends her master hands after the duo, but prior to getting fisted the arm suddenly explodes as RMC explains that when the hands open they are vulnerable to most high-powered rounds along with the thrusters because it has almost no protection. Seeing that all her toys are being destroyed the Orbital Knight transforms into a giant fister and blasts off into the sky to confront our heroes, and Naho tries to blow it off course but it's too big for him to move so Slane is forced to stall the plane to avoid a trip to heaven though this leaves them in a position where it's impossible to dodge again. The Martian declares herself the victor when she suddenly tanks a firework to the face as a barrage of people the leaders starts heading her way. The Deucalion begins rising from the cliffside to enter the combat zone with a Salem at the helm who has activated the Alvnoa Drive, which makes the Orbital Knight confused about how the Earthlings gained this technology before she decides to charge them head-on, but the King of Backshots takes out her thrusters to leave the woman helpless on the ground so the battleship can give her the heaviest face-sitting session in the world. Ryette resolves to slide on all Martians to avenge her father as she picks up a pure to follow the double tap rule, while the rest of our survivors celebrate making it through another attack. In the sky Slane asks Inaho to take him to the princess but RMC questions how he knew that she was still alive which makes the pilot ponder if they are also trying to exploit a Salem for their own gain, and as tension rises both of them decides to open fire on each other with Inaho coming out the victor of the standoff, leaving Slane to take a swim with the fishes. On the Deucalion, the commander learns the truth about what really happened to the princess and promises to protect her until they arrive at their main base where she can send a transmission to Mars, though she interrogates our party about why it was kept a secret and finds out that there could be people working with the assassins on board. A Salem along with Inaho leaves the audience room when his friend suddenly interrupts them to discuss the rumors of Martians on board then announces his intentions to slide for his friend again, but after the princess apologizes to him on behalf of her people it's proven that the Great Horny can even overcome the endless flames of vengeance. Our duo goes up on the deck where Inaho tells her about the pilot who saved all their lives, but he conveniently leaves out how that meeting ended, and as Salem shows him Slane's good luck charm then reveals that when they were kids he told many stories about how beautiful his home planet was which made her dedicated to seeking peace between the two people so they can both benefit from a healthy relationship. At Count Criteo's fortress, we find that the pilot has been getting some shocking surprises as his tormentor asks why he went to the island and what led to the orbital night becoming past tense, but slain is the goat so he doesn't snitch. Criteo continues the shock therapy until Sasbom intervenes because if the captive breaks this will all be pointless, which provokes the Count into drawing his pure to start deep throating the prisoner with his pole, then he threatens to show him something mind-blowing in the near future, before leaving the poor bastard to suffer alone. A few tragic hours later, the Martians decide to try a different method of persuasion and start assaulting the young man relentlessly as Criteo watches his victim's pain in endless euphoric bliss. Eventually, our goat reaches his limit and accuses the Count of being a part of the Orbital Knight's conspiracy to use the princess's passing as an excuse to make war with Earth. However, the accusation enrages the Count to the point where he unfolds his people corrector and channels the memory of his ancestors to use plantation breathing form 1864. A soldier intrudes on the punishment to report that they found the Gundam that was lost 15 years ago without its Alvnoa drive though the Count dismisses this since the humans have no way to activate it. Slain suddenly starts laughing so Criteo decides to end his suffering despite the protests of Sasbom who abruptly ends his transmission. The Count questions why the pilot would be happy in a time like this, which leads him to the realization that without plot armor it is impossible for the Earthlings to defeat the Orbital Knight while not having an Alvnoa drive of their own, but the only way that would be possible is if the princess was still alive to activate it. Criteo kindly asks Slane to confirm his suspicions and with the last of his strength the goat tells them that a Salem will destroy all their plans when she arrives. 
Seeing that the pilot was right or die for the princess all along the count cradles slain in his hand while begging for his forgiveness as the medics approach to treat the hero's injuries, Criteo contacts his command center to tell them to send a transmission to all orbital knights to cease hostilities against the people of Earth, but they notice that an object is traveling towards their fortress at high speeds. On the outside we find Sazbaum and his Eva falling from the skies to crash into the castle, Criteo comes face to face with the true traitor and challenges him to an honorable duel with Gundams, but Sazbaum simply lasers the fool, then retrieves Slane's unconscious body from the ruins before blasting off into the sky to return to his fortress. On the Gukalian, Yuki monitors the new soldiers' progress as they're using virtual reality to improve their fighting skills when Rayet joins them to train so she can smoke even more Martians. The assassin's daughter enters the simulation and does better than anyone would suspect which makes her request for Yuki to raise the difficulty so Inaho's sister decides to give Rayet something familiar, but once the young lady is confronted by Baron Glizzyhead's Gundam she begins having a full-blown panic attack until the mech goes offline. In the cafeteria Rayet reminisces about what she lost as the princess arrives to join her for lunch, the assassin's daughter inquires about her clothing and as Salem describes the second worst trait in the history of humankind prior to two little ones coming over to give the princess a gift, then Rayet wonders why she would reveal herself to everyone despite the risk before leaving to eat elsewhere. In the doctor's office, they are trying to use virtual reality to treat the teacher's PTSD. The test starts out with the patient managing the simulation well, but after the Martian shows up he gets swept away in the memory and we see that his entire unit was unprepared for this battle so they were mercilessly slaughtered. The teacher's tank gets flipped into the air though it seems that his team survived until his friend calls for help because his foot is stuck inside the vehicle, when a fire erupts that starts gradually cooking the men alive, and following the heart-wrenching screams of the commander's brother begging for the pain to end, the teacher uses a pewer to put his soul at rest before escaping from the tank as it suddenly explodes. The victim of war freaks out from his visions and is disappointed in himself for failing again which makes the doctor reveal that his trauma is not caused by the fighting but by the guilt he feels from smoking his friend and ends the treatment for today, the psychologist then meets with the commander to give her the teacher's patient file so both of them can recover from the loss of their loved one together. Inside the bathroom Rayet is having a mental breakdown because she doesn't understand why the princess seems happy after experiencing so many hardships while it's hard for her to even make up reasons to go on living, but unexpectedly the princess chooses the worst time possible to take a shower and her maid leaves to get a change of clothes. A Salem enjoys the hot water running down her curvaceous body when Rayet comes from behind and uses Slane's good luck charm to give a royal neck massage until the princess gives up on fighting back then she allows the loot box to fall to the floor. The Aldnoa drive abruptly deactivates which freaks out the command center and forces them to make a crash landing though luckily nothing was damaged, everyone realizes that something must have happened to the princess so they rush to her location where she's found without a pulse, but Inaho begins doing CPR in an attempt to resuscitate a Salem, and after a few minutes of trying the princess of the Verse Empire finally escapes the cold embrace of death. Our MC inquires into what happened as Rayet steals the commander's pewer to persuade the doctor's party to leave the room immediately, and Naho questions what caused this to happen and the confused woman confesses that she is a Martian who was sent to Earth alongside her father with the promise of nobility if they put the princess on a t-shirt. But after completing the mission the orbital knight made her an orphan in order to keep his secret safe. Rayet admits to them that she has no one on Verse or this planet to care about anymore, however when a Salem revealed the truth all the people accepted her and gave the princess a place among them despite the fact that if she never came down to Earth then no one would have suffered the effects of this war. A Salem apologizes for bringing misery to this world and agrees that she is responsible for millions of people being sent to the Shadow Realm while slowly walking towards her executioner. The princess falls to her knees to beg forgiveness from everyone for the hardships they now face, but Rayet can't bring forth the courage to take a Salem's life again so she decides to give herself brain surgery instead. 
Inaho Flash steps over to introduce the woman to the floor, where our MC declares that he doesn't care about which planet she came from since they have been fighting together all this time, then 100 IQ Inaho entrusts the mentally unstable lady with the lethal weapon and thankfully the commander is there to take it back before ordering Yuki to put Ryan into custody. They take the princess to the doctor's office who advises a Salem to get some rest though the captain comes for her anyway so she can reactivate the Aldnoa drive to get the ship back into the air. At Sasbom's fortress Argot awakens from sleep mode to find the Count by his side, who tells Slane that Kriteo has been made into a hashtag and reveals that his father once helped him in the past thus his actions were simply to repay an overdue favor, then the Orbital Knight confesses to being the true traitor behind the conspiracy to put the princess on a t-shirt. At the dinner table Slane tries his best to convince Sasbom to spare Salem's life, but it's unfeasible because her presence can undo all his carefully laid plans, which makes the pilot lunge at him with a body penetrator while questioning why he would go through this much effort just to construct a war. Count Sasbom explains that when the first ruler was declared king of the Verse Empire Mars was a planet that resembled Earth in nature, however as time passed by the thin atmosphere made the environment almost inhabitable. To remedy this the second emperor chose to command all the greatest minds to make weapons far beyond human comprehension to rule over them with an iron fist instead of coming up with ways to feed his people, and when all the citizens started to riot the royal family began producing propaganda to blame earth for all their problems. Soon after the king made plans for an invasion using the Hypergate to place troops behind the moon, but he also sent an advanced unit down to Earth to scout the enemy's strength that consisted of himself along with his fiancée, where they suddenly got warnings of massive objects heading their way after the moon fragmented into many pieces. Sasbom's betrothed gets trapped in the lava so she begs him to abandon her and with a heavy heart he left her behind before the island was blown to smithereens. The Count says it's the royal family who causes Mars to suffer by not taking Earth's resources and also sending his fiancée to her grave, but with this war he will correct all their mistakes while getting vengeance on their entire bloodline for what they took from him, before warning Slane that even though his father once saved his life anyone who stands in his way will be swiftly dispatched. On the Gukalian, the commander contacts the main base to signal their arrival prior to going underground to land the battleship into the port area. All our survivors begin to depart from the vessel and seeing that it's finally safe the students decide to step away from the fighting until they're called into action again. The first princess of the Verse Empire enters the conference room to start a transmission to Mars, where she reveals that it was traitors within the Orbital Knight who tried to assassinate her to get an excuse to plunder this planet then a Salem commands all her royal subjects to stop this war immediately and begin peace negotiations with Earth as soon as possible. At Sasbom's fortress Slane is brought to Kruteo's Gundam which is now useless since its old Noah drive deactivated when the Orbital Knight passed away. The Count discloses that they found the princess's location by following a broadcast the Earthlings sent to their moon base, but since his allies control all the communication systems of Salem's cry for peace will remain unheard. Sasbom releases our goat from his chains and gives him the choice of joining the planet where he was born or fighting for the Empire who raised him before going into the command room to make his fortress descend and bring down a great calamity on the people of Earth. On the army's main base they begin sounding the alarm to signal an incoming attack as Sasbom knocks on their front door, the military tries a futile attempt at retaliation and the Count returns fire upon them though his people the leaders penetrate deep into the ground to explode inside the enemy's soft spots. The Titan squad is deployed to fight anything that enters the hole, but when Sasbom descends from the heavens he begins handing out Michael Jackson concert tickets to all the soldiers who are present, before sending out his ground troops with the sole objective of ending the princess's subscription to life. A Salem sits in the ruins of her hopes and dreams while coming to the realization that words alone cannot stop this conflict, so she signals in Naho to reveal that to shut down the fortress they have to defeat the Orbital Knight or get her close enough to manually deactivate its Old Noah drive. The commander prepares to launch the Gukalian however they suddenly take heavy damage from the Martians' artillery units as the princess arrives on the scene to try and get on board, 
all the enemy soldiers start focusing their fire on a Salem but Ryuk comes in just in time to distract them long enough for Inaho's friend to pull her inside the battleship so she can escape. The captain tries to contact the command tower but after receiving no answer she launches a barrage of boomers at the doors to create their own exit so they can make a temporary retreat into the atmosphere. Inaho makes a plan to drop decoy robots from the sky to cover the main force that will land on the fortress with the goal of disabling all the turrets, which will allow the princess to descend safely to turn off the Aldnoa drive. Inside Sasbom's fortress the Martians receive a report of an overwhelming force rapidly approaching and fire off bombardments of anti-air missiles that wipe out the decoys which release flares to disrupt their sensors, then the Titan squad skydives into the combat zone to enact their plan. The student starts panicking but a veteran gives her encouragement before being blasted into the Shadow Realm as all the turrets turn towards our allies to devastate their unit. But luckily Inaho's plot armor protects him from becoming a casualty so he can close the distance to clear the way for a safe landing prior to unleashing all his boomers to capture the zone for the rest of the team. Our allies get ready to send down the princess to the drop site and opens the hatch to find Sasbom patiently waiting outside who begins pounding the battleship with rockets until it slowly falls back to earth but the commander decides that she won't go out like a little bitch before ordering the helmsman to kamikaze the Deucalion into the Count's fortress in a desperate venture to do any damage they can. Yuki tries to contact the battleship and the teacher answers to inform everyone of his party's current state before giving them the responsibility of completing this mission, and Naho's sister enters the vessel where it's found that the princess somehow remained unharmed during the crash so she throws her comrade's loot box on the floor then takes his place to pilot the mech towards the Aldnoa Drive. As Salem awakens from sleep mode confused though she quickly remembers what happened, she asks Yuki if there can ever be peace between their people after what they've done and Inaho confesses that nations start wars all the time for many different reasons which is why even after this one ends he won't detest any Martians just because of where they were born. But Sasbom intercepts the channel to say that he's their biggest hater who hates the way Earthlings walk, talk, and even dress, as he takes flight on the battlefield to block our allies' way. Inaho resolves to take on the Orbital Knight by himself while the rest of his unit escorts the princess to the Aldnoa Drive, the Count commences the fight by calling his two swords to come to his location so he can begin a fusion montage with all the parts of the Orbital Knight's Gundams that have been destroyed thus far to form a Walmart Voltron. Inaho pews his opponent, however the shield absorbs the projectiles which gives Sasbom the chance to reveal his noble phantasm to strike down our protagonist but Inaho passes the quick time event, then the titan squad tries to help though the count nearly high fives the poor bastards before fisting them into the afterlife. We see the pilot flying overhead to search for the princess where he gets targeted by the earthlings and is forced to land the sky carrier for the last time. Slain raises his weapon at a titan who commands him to surrender prior to the turrets putting an end to his life as a Martian comes over to explain that enemy combatants have made their way inside the fortress. Our goat is confused since everyone knows that he is an earthling but the man says it doesn't matter where Slain was born because anyone willing to point their weapon at the enemy is their ally before he's sent to Martian Jesus. The young man is forced to run away from the pursuing earthlings all the way to the docking area where he's compelled to enter Kruteo's Gundam for protection, but surprisingly Slain is able to reactivate the Eva's Aldnoa drive because when the princess saved his life she also unknowingly gave our goat the authority of an orbital knight. On another side of the fortress Yuki is pinned down by the Martians on ending attacks so as Salem thinks of another route which leads to their objective that is too small to travel in with robots, and Naho's body abruptly breaks through the ceiling with Sasbom following close behind to bring an end to their existence, and the Titan squad engages in a fruitless attempt to hold him off while RMC pleads with them to run away. The Count launches the Doom Fists to take out an unnamed character which gives Inaho the chance to do massive damage to the Martian by targeting the gap within the barrier to destroy the remote control that signals his fisters, then he blows up Sasbom's leg and puts the mighty Orbital Knight on his back before standing over him with a pewer so the Count can see the face of the one who bested him. 
the waifu party exits their titan to take the princess down the route that the Alvnoa drive is being kept so she can start the process of deactivating the fortress's power source, leaving our MC by himself to face off against the orbital knight who refuses to stop fighting. And Naho tosses away his weapon to throw hands with Sazbomb and the Count charges at him but RMC easily dodges the attack before going over to equip the Fap Arms 9000, the Martian continues the march forward to make Naho a head shorter but he gets a free tummy tuck in return that takes all the strength out of his knees, as Slain arrives on the battlefield though he's not sure whose side to take. RMC gets ready to give Sazbomb a pounding that he will never forget, However, the Count swears he will end this cycle of hatred by wiping out all of Earth's population to give his people a chance to live in a land filled with clean air and water while destroying the tyrants who fed the citizens lies to save themselves. After hearing this speech Clutch Godslain decides to save the Orbital Knight by tackling the two fighters into the room where the princess was turning off the Alvnoa drive. Our goat exits his Gundam to see the princess checking on Inaho to make sure he's alright when she suddenly gets an unexpected backshot prior to having her mind blown, Sasbomb thanks Slain for saving him like his father did until our goat draws his pewer and just starts blasting up to the point where he runs out of ammo, so the Count has to show him where to aim his next shot. But before Slain can end the Martian he is distracted by Inaho's broken body desperately making his way towards the unmoving form of a Salem to see if she can be saved. The new Orbital Knight warns him about touching the princess as the two men meet each other for the first time in person. Then our MC draws a weapon and earns an extra hole in his head as a reward leaving Slain alone in the room surrounded by all the carnage this war has caused. Like for a cat girl, subscribe for a waifu, and remember to stay swifty! Ooh.